of discipleship uh, is interesting because there was a, a fella, uh, Diedrich Bonhoeffer, he was a German fella. He was born on February the 4th, 1906 in uh, Breslau, uh, Bres, Bres, uh, Germany. And anyway, he died April the 9th, 1945 in a German concentration camp. And anyway, he was a very religious man. He preached, he was a theologian. And it's kind of interesting, you look at the concentration camp, of course there were a lot of Jewish people and uh, Adolf Hitler's hatred and animosity toward them, but actually there were other people. And this Diedrich Bonhoeffer, he would be one of the fellows, people that would say anything against the Third Reich, they, they got in trouble. And anyway, they would send them off to the concentration camp. And if he could have just held out, because they actually liberated the camp that he was in about two weeks after that, but. Anyway, it was, life was tough if you were in the concentration camp. But anyway, he wrote a book called uh, The Cost of Discipleship. And uh, this cost of discipleship, there are a couple of quotes I want to look at. He said that cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ. People want to talk about God's grace, God's favor. And it's an unmerited favor, and that's true. And it is a Bible topic, it's wonderful, and it's, uh, it's wonderful to, to ponder about. But if you subtract the idea of discipleship and the cost and the requirements to come unto the Lord, you, you, you're missing it. And that's really what he was kind of emphasizing. That's the idea of cheap grace, is to say, well, you know, favor's out there, forgiveness is out there. And it doesn't really require much of you. Just uh, simply acknowledge Christ or accept him as your Lord and Savior and just leave off the whole idea of repentance and leave off the idea of discipleship. Then he points out in his book, Costly Grace confronts us as a gracious call to follow Jesus. It comes as a word of forgiveness to the broken spirit and of the contrite heart. It's costly because it compels a man to submit to the yoke of Christ and to follow him. It is grace because Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That we have obligations when we come to Jesus the Christ. And so there's this contrast of what we see being preached in the world, this cheap grace. Or are we going to look at the true grace of God? That is, it was very costly. Cheap grace. Let's look at that one. Uh, we've got a few little memes to talk about. Here's one. Grace, half off sale. People like the idea they like, a, they like a bargain and they look at grace as if it's some sort of bargain and you get a half price. Or here's a signboard somebody made up, the Cheap Grace Narcissist Church. A narcissist is somebody who just thinks about me, myself, and I. It's all about me. And so the subtitle, it's never about God, it's always about me. Welcome. And uh, unfortunately, we have some that, that look at religion this way and look at Christianity this way, that it's more about me. You know, don't ask what we can do for God. It's more like, what can God do for me? And it's all about my desires and what I want. And that's, that's this presentation of a cheap grace. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. We have to change. The call of God is to repent. We must change. We have to make a turnabout. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross. You know, you talk about the cross. That was very costly on the Lord's part of what he did in order to obtain our forgiveness. Is, is this grace that Jesus manifested in dying on the cross. Let's begin over here in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Paul says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, repair, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, healthy doctrine. But after their own lust they shall draw to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto myths, turned unto fables. We, we want it kind of watered down. We want to make things smooth. We, we, want, we want a palatable doctrine that, that's smooth. Don't want to talk about anything that's hard or difficult, about repentance, about making sacrifice, about being disciples. We just want to kind of make it easy. Okay, so sugar-coated preaching is dangerous to our soul. That's what Paul is warning about here. 
that there would come a time that, hey, you know, we, we don't like all this Bible stuff. You know, always citing the Bible. And some of the things in the Bible are difficult to, to hear. I mean, you see that in John chapter 6. It says, well, I mean, this is, this is hard. I mean, who, who can hear this? this? These teachings of Jesus seem pretty difficult. Well, the point is, it's better to speak the truth that hurts and then heals than to hear some falsehood that comforts, makes everything smooth, makes everything all rosy and wonderful, but then ultimately it kills because it's not pointing us in the right direction. And so, Timothy, you watch in all things, endure affliction, do the work of an evangelist, fully carry out your ministry. And then notice another passage over here in the book of Romans chapter 10. Paul says, Rather my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them, bear them witness that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. And like the Jews that Paul speaks about here is that people get in the idea, instead of listening to God, that God's going to tell us what to do. That we're not going to, well, there's just some things we don't like, and so we just don't want to talk about them. We just won't uh, uh, you know, speak about them, or we'll just try to water them down, you know, try to make it all smooth and gentle, etc., and proclaim cheap grace. That really, you don't have to worry about this whole idea of discipleship, this idea of repentance, and, and just live, and, and just be sincere, be, be, be sincere and genuine, and doesn't really make any difference what you believe, and blah, 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 blah. No. It does make a difference what we believe. Are we to be sincere? Yeah, we're to be sincere. Are we to be genuine? Yes, we're to be genuine. But we need to be genuine, committed to the Lord and His truth. And to do that which is right. So there's cheap grace. And we see this being proclaimed throughout the denominational world of proclaiming cheap grace. That you just kind of do whatever you want to and don't worry about it. It'll all wash out in the end, etc., etc. But then on the flip side, we have costly grace. And this costly grace is that Jesus gave his life for us. And that's where it all begins when we talk about this costly grace is what it cost God to bring about salvation. It was a tremendous, tremendous cost. I mean, you got there, John 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. It doesn't explain in John 3, 16, his death on the cross, but the idea of God giving, we know because the rest of the story points out that he gave Jesus to die upon the cross. There in Mark chapter 14, Jesus there in the Garden of Gethsemane, he says, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto you. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. You know, God didn't say, okay, well, this looks a little bit tougher than I thought, and ah, let's go to a different plan. This, this is a little bit too hard. No, there was no other plan. And so he submitted to the plan of God that he would have to die on the cross. And then let's look at Matthew chapter 27, just to clue in part of the crucifixion scene and what took place right before and then being nailed to that cross. It says in verse 26, beginning, Then released he Barabbas. Barabbas, he was a troublemaking, murderous, just perfect representation of the devil, and that's who the Jews clamored for, was Barabbas, the son of the father, that is, of the devil. And so they released Barabbas, and they're going to turn Jesus over to be scourged, which they don't go on a lot of detail, which were to be, to be whipped by some healthy, strong soldier taking a whip to his back. Scary Jesus, deliver him to be crucified. Verse 27, it says, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers, and they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had planted a crown of thorns, to be emblematic of a royal crown, but it was the mockery because they didn't really believe he was a king, but he was king. It says, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand, as if it was a royal scepter, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and they spit upon him. You know, that, that is so degrading when people spit on another human being. It just shows the utter disrespect and degrading and contempt for another person to spit upon a person. 
And the amazing thing is, you, you have to you have to remember, Jesus could have could have stopped it. It wasn't like you know this, this got way out of hand and it's got way beyond my control. He could have stopped it at any moment. He could have stopped it a long time ago. He could have just said the word. I mean, he could have just wiped them out, just like like stepping on some some little ants and just just wiped them off uh, off the the face of the earth and just stop this whole mess. But he didn't. And he stands there taking this. That, that is the epitome of what meekness is all about. That is power under control. To have the power, but you don't exercise the power to get out of this. Though he could have. He could have called more than 12 legions of angels, as he told, as he told uh, Peter. But no, this had to be. It was the high price for our redemption. And so they struck him up on the head. He's got this crown of thorns. And after that, they mocked him, making fun of him. They took the robe off him, put his own clothes on him, and led him away to uh, crucify him. And they came out, and they found a man of Sirene, Simon by name, him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they were come to the place called Golgotha, that is the, to say the place of a skull, they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him. Doesn't explain about this whole idea, this whole idea of nailing him to the to the beam, hoisting him up upon the cross there, and, and the nails through his feet, etc. They crucified him, parting his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and for my uh, clothing did they cast lots. And then they sat down, and there he stays upon the cross till later that afternoon, until he ultimately dies, suffering and agonizing, just a horrible, shameful type of death. I mean, it was a tremendous cost that God paid in order to bring about our redemption. There, it's just tremendous. That's when we, when we talk about grace. It, it, was co- it was costly grace. I mean, just think about Jesus dying there on the cross and all that he suffered and all the way before and just total, total injustice, the total travesty of justice, just just. just running roughshod over him and had no care for what was right and true. And there were plenty of people who knew that he was innocent. Pilate knew that he was innocent. Mrs. Pilate knew that he was innocent because she had received the, the dream. Uh, you had the soldiers. They recognized, Gee, surely this was an innocent man. Even one of the thieves recognized that, that we deserve this, but certainly not Jesus. There were plenty of people who knew, but they didn't care. They didn't care. They're just totally ungodly and wretched. And that's what it cost in order to bring about our redemption. And so the price was paid for, the, for our debt of sin. There was no other way. It had to be this way. I mean, Jesus prayed. I mean, he was suffering. He was dropping there in Gethsemane like uh, great drops of blood, the sweat coming off under great duress. But yet he continues on and goes through the cross and comes triumphantly over death because he was raised from the dead. That was the price was paid for the debt of my sin and for your sin, the sins of the world. And the call of Jesus is in the Great Commission is that we are to become disciples. Notice that in the book of Matthew chapter 28, Jesus says that all power, all authority is given unto me heaven and earth. Verse 19, he says, Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations. Some translations say, go teach. Well, Making disciples is going to be a process of teaching. And making disciples is somebody who's going to be a learner. And then, secondarily, is going to follow. You know, there, there's, sometimes you, you can get information, but it, it doesn't, really, doesn't really amount to anything. It's like, well, how many counties in the state of Kentucky? Well, 120 counties. Well, does that affect your life? Does it? demand anything? Does it change you in any way? I mean, it's just infor- it's, it's the factual information in 120 counties, but it's just information. But when we learn the information of Jesus, it, it demands something, that we act upon it. And so when we hear about these teachings of Jesus, this costly grace of Jesus dying on the cross, the call is, is to go and make disciples that we become his followers, that we want to be his students. We want to be his followers. That we want to learn of him and we want to follow what he teaches. And so he then talks about being baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Then teaching them. Them who? Those that have become disciples, that have obeyed the first principles and, and becoming Christian. Teaching them to observe all things. He doesn't say teach, 
you know, teach, to, teach them to observe some of the things or, or uh, a few of the things or, or a lot of the things or pretty near everything. No, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. And so we become disciples. And disciples, they're, they're, this whole idea of discipleship, that was, that was the point that he was trying to make uh, uh, this Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his book, that we're called to become disciples. That the grace of God calls us to uh, live a new lifestyle and to become uh, learners and followers of Jesus. There in Luke chapter 14 it says in verse 25, And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them. Great multitudes. I mean, just a big crowd. Maybe, maybe there were hundreds. Maybe there were thousands. There, there were times where Jesus would talk to thousands of people, hundreds of people. And you think, well, okay, success it's great it's wonderful we've got a big crowd here well not necessarily and jesus recognized that and so to these great multitudes what does he tell them in verse 26 if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brother and sister jay and his own life also he cannot be my disciple there, there are requirements to be a disciple, and that is we have to love the lord more than mother and father and children brother sisters etc and even our own life, that God has to come first. We have to love him more. And if we're not willing to do that, then you can't be my disciple. Of course, if we can't be his disciple, we can't be forgiven. And if we can't be forgiven, we can't get to heaven. I mean, th that's just the logical consequences of it. But we want to be a disciple because you want to be a disciple so we can be forgiven. And we want to be forgiven so we can become more and more like Jesus. And we want to be ready for the judgment. And we want to enter into eternal life and be saved from wrath to come. And you see, all that follows by becoming a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ. Verse 27, whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. The cross. What is a cross? Is it something you eat like... Uh, you know, soup with or bowl of spaghetti? No. <laughs> a cross is a, it's a, it was an instrument of death. It was the instrument of death, capital punishment, that people were crucified, they were killed. And so when we bear our cross, we take up our cross, that is we crucify our desires and our will that the will of God might be, be in us. Then Jesus tells a couple of stories about counting the cost, whether we're building whatever, uh, build a house, build a, uh, 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 build, building a, a vineyard and, and all that and uh, the various things uh, uh, that go around a vineyard. Right? You want to count the cost in doing that. If you're going to go to war, you want to stop and count the cost, whether you're going to be able to finish the job. And so Jesus says that we've got to count the cost. Verse 33, so likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsakes not all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. Jesus must be first. Jesus must be preeminent. That we love him more than all. And that's discipleship. And that's what Mr. Bonhoeffer was talking about when he says that this costly grace is going to, it's going to include repentance. It's going to include discipleship. That we become a follower of Jesus Christ. It is a high cost. There in Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13 Really, the whole chapter is a bunch of parables. But there are two little short parables here in 44 through 46. And there's a little bit of contrast, but there's one similarity that we're going to talk about. In verse 44, it says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a treasure hid in the field, which when a man has found, he hides, and for the joy thereof goes and sells all that he has about this field. So, so here you sort of stumble upon this hidden treasure. You know, you're walking through, and hey, this field's for sale, and somebody buried their treasure. They buried their riches. They've died. You know, it's been lost. And boy, if I could buy the field, I'll get the treasure that's hidden there. And so he goes and sells all that he has to, to get that field. He really wasn't looking for it. He just sort of stumbles upon it. He just finds it. But then in verse 45 and 46, you, you've got a little bit different case and that this is this is somebody that's seeking for that goodly pearl again the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking fine pearls who when he found one pearl of great price went and sold all that he had and bought it so here's somebody actively seeking so sometimes you have people that they just stumble upon christianity they stumble upon the treasures of the gospel and they accept it sort of like the the first pattern 
And then the second one, you got people that are actively seeking after God. They're looking for truth. They're looking for what's right. And they ultimately find it. But what is common between both of them, in order for this man to buy that field for for this man to buy that one pearl of great price, both of them says they had to sell all. Which is to say what? Well, we're going to have to give all in order to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. It's not like, well, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to give God most of my life. I'm going to give him priority in most things. No, it doesn't work that way. Either we're going to give all or we give none. It doesn't work part way. Either you go wholeheartedly in it, you sell all, and the Lord becomes preeminent, or he has no place at all. That's what we're learning from these passages. We to give ourselves. Giving of ourself. There, notice in the book of uh, Galatians 2 and verse 20, I am crucified with Christ, Paul says. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. So Paul and Paul's desires and Paul's, Paul's wishes, you know, those are crucified. They're killed in order that Christ might live in me. And that goes for all of us. You know, an interesting thing about, you know, Paul talked about Romans chapter 12, about that we offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. You know, in the Old Testament sacrifices, you, you, you slayed this animal and they'd lay it upon the altar. But when you slay the animal, it was dead. The thing about living sacrifice is like it wants to crawl off the altar. <laughs> it wants to get away. You know, we don't, we don't want to go through all this. We, we want to get, get around it. But we are to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice wholeheartedly to God. And that's what Paul speaks about that in this text. Then notice there in Philippians chapter 1, for me to live is what? For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. There in Philippians chapter 3, Paul says, uh, well, he, first, in the first part of chapter 3, he talks about all the advantages, you know, that he, uh, that he had as a Jew. You know, he circumcised eight day. He was a, a Hebrew of Hebrews. That is, both his parents were Hebrews. He was of the strictest sect. He was zealous. I mean, all these outward things that he could have, counted as great gain but he didn't have Christ and Christ is the savior of the world and when he come to the knowledge of Jesus it's like he left all that behind but what things were gained to me those I counted lost for Christ yea doubtless I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but rubbish that I may win Christ and be found in him not having mine own righteousness which is of the law but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness of God uh, by faith, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, be made conformable in his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. That is, the resurrection of the just. We're going to be raised from the dead, whether we're an atheist, an agnostic, we hate God, it doesn't make sense. Everybody's going to be raised in the final day. But Paul is striving for the resurrection of the just, the good side. And so it is. We must give ourselves to God. There in Colossians 3, and notice there in verse 4, Paul says, When Christ, who is our life? Who is our life? Christ is our life, Paul says. And then notice there in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, this is a great text. It says, Moreover, brethren, we want you to know the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of the joy and the deep poverty, uh, and their deep poverty abounded the riches of the liberality. So here you have three classes, right? So you have the poor saints in Jerusalem. They're the ones that needing the help. They just don't have. And then you have the Macedonians. They're in poverty, but that's relative because they had sufficient for themselves, but they had even, they could make some sacrifice. And then you had the Corinthians, and they were pretty well to do, and they could make a big sacrifice and a big help because in dollars and cents, they, they would have had a lot more. But Paul uses the Macedonians to help these poor saints in Jerusalem. Here's these Macedonian brethren that even though they're relatively poor, you know, they're like in the second world, and they're going to help people in the third world. And here's the Corinthians. And they're in the first world. Paul's using these people in the second world. It's kind of like a few years ago when there was a big uh, typhoon that came through the Philippines. It was like there were brethren in Ecuador that heard about it, and they wanted to give, and they made a special sacrifice. They 
kind of like a second world country, but they wanted to make a sacrifice for the poor brethren in the Philippines who suffered great devastation from this. And, you know, it was just, it was just amazing. And be like, be like the Macedonians. Paul says in verse 3, For to their ability I bear record, yea, and beyond their ability they were willing of themselves, begging us. Isn't that interesting? It wasn't that Paul was begging them. You know, it seems like sometimes when there's a need, you have to do a lot of begging or asking. But here, no, they, they were begging Paul. Paul, please, can we have a part in this? We want to help. Maybe, maybe the total dollar wasn't all that big, but they wanted help, begging us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. Now, verse 5 gives the key. How, how could they do that? The, these people that were like in the second world status want to help these poor saints in Jerusalem that would be like in third world. Verse 5 is the key. And this they did not as we expected, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. You see, the key was they gave themselves. And once you give yourself, giving your money is easy because you've already given yourself, which is your all in all. They had gave themselves, and so giving their money... Uh, taking money out of the wallet was easy. Why? Because they gave themselves. That's what costly grace. That's what God's wanting us to do. Jesus came and gave himself to set the example that we would also follow that same example of giving ourselves to him. To love God with all our hearts. Remember there in Matthew chapter 26. Teacher, what's the great commandment, uh, greatest commandment in the law? You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. And this is the first and great commandment, the second is like of that, to love your neighbor yourself. There it is. First and, first and great commands. Love God with all your heart. Love your neighbor yourself. All these things, all the law and prophets hang on these two things. They are the foundation. Every other command relates to these two basic, two great commandments. Loving God with all the heart. There in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, number 14 and 15. It says, for the love of Christ constrains us. I mean, when we really stop and we, we, we really think about what Jesus went through and all that he suffered, just coming to this world was, was a big enough sacrifice, even the glories of heaven, of perfect bliss, and coming to this world with its sin and its sickness and its heartaches and its hardships, and to live among men and to be mistreated, to be uh, uh, spat upon and reviled and all that he went through to be nailed to the cross, all that he did, you, you just you have to stand amazed. It, it's a very compelling. And it wasn't because like, hey, you know, that's something I, I, I want to go down there and try that out. No, he came because it was his love for us. Because it was the only way that redemption could be made possible. Jesus would have to die on the cross. For the love of Christ constrains us, it compels us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they who, lo that they who live should no longer live unto themselves, but unto him who died for them and rose again. The implication is that Jesus gave his all that we will do in like return. God calls upon us to live godly lives. There in the Old Testament minor prophet Micah, he talks about this. What, what, what does God want? You know, I mean, what, what does God want? Does he want to just give some more money in the offering? Does he want us to maybe sing a few more songs, offer a few more prayers? I mean, exactly what, what is God offering a sacrifice here and there? Maybe make a few more sacrifices. I mean, exactly what does the Lord want? Well, Micah addresses that. In Micah chapter 6 and verse 6, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old, that is from the Old Testament system of sacrifice? You would say, shall I come with a few more dollars for the collection plate? Should, should, I, should I read the Bible a few extra chapters every, every week to be more devoted to the Lord? You know, make a few more sacrifices, make a few more calls upon the sick? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has showed you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? He wants us to do justly. That is to be something, be, 
be, be right within ourselves and to want to live right and to do the right thing and be uh, just and honorable and to live right and to, and to love mercy, that is, in relationship to our fellow man, that we're going to treat people right and be merciful and kind and, and, and helpful to our fellow man and then to walk humbly before our God. I mean, it's those three things within ourself, in our relationship to other people, in our relationship for, before God. That's what he wants us to do, to walk humbly before God. Paul says it this way in Titus chapter 2, there in verses 11 and 12, For the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us. And the first thing God's grace teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, that it get rid of the bad stuff. That's where repentance comes in. We're going to have to turn from bad stuff. Bad stuff brings nothing but heartache. It brings pain. It brings separation from God. It brings all kinds of tragedies in our life. Get rid of the bad stuff. Is that, is that sufficient? Just turn away from bad things? No. There's something that we should do. That we should live sensibly or soberly. That is, have a right attitude about ourselves. That we want to be right. We want to do the right thing. Get, get an attitude adjustment within ourselves. To live sensibly, to live righteously, that is, in right relationship with our, our fellow man, that we treat people right, we, we, we talk to them right, we have the right attitude toward them, we're not arrogant, puffed up, haughty toward our fellow man, trying to, trying to uh, take advantage of other people, no, treat people righteously. And to live godly, that is, that we walk before the great God of heaven, that we walk in humility. Exactly what... Micah said is what Paul's saying. That's what God's grace teaches us, that we make this full self-surrender unto God, that we give ourselves, that, that we're willing to give all, that we're going to put him first and put him before all things and his will, to exalt him as Lord and King, that he's the Lord of our life. He's the Lord of our lips. He's the Lord of our thoughts. He's the Lord of our, our priorities, our decisions. We always consult, you know, what would the Lord have me to do? What, Lord, what's your will? In whatever the situation, whatever the relationship, we're always thinking about, what does God want me to do? You see, the only people who are mad at you for speaking the truth are those who are living a lie. Living a lie is following this cheap grace. That, that, that's, that's a lie, that you don't have to be a true disciple, a true follower of Jesus. And you don't really have to repent. You don't have to worry about this whole idea of being a disciple, being a student and following the teaching of Jesus and be conscientious and be faithful in the death. Oh, that's all good and fine if you want to, but don't worry about it. It'll all wash out in the end just, just as long as you say you accept Jesus as your personal Savior. No. The truth is we are called to discipleship. Jesus says go and make disciples. We want people to be disciples. We want people to be followers. Does that mean we're going to be perfect? No. But we'll talk about that in Philippians 3. I, I'm not saying that I'm perfect, but I'm trying. I'm striving to be what God would have me to be, to be that living sacrifice, to give my all, to love God with all my heart and soul and mind, and to love my neighbor as myself. You see, Jesus gave his life for you. He gave his life for me. And when we really, really, really think and ponder about that, you know, we can return to favor. That is, we give our lives to Jesus. We give our heart. Wholehearted commitment to the Lord, not this... 80%, 60%, 55%, just as long as you get over 50%, hey, it's all going to work out. No, I want to give my heart totally to the Lord and to his service. I want to be a follower. I want to be a true student, disciple of Jesus the Christ. We extend an invitation with this question, will you give yourself to Jesus? It's the only way you're going to become a, a follower of Jesus is you're going to have to give yourself wholehearted commitment, wholehearted give yourself to the Lord. You hear this good news, how Jesus Christ died on the cross? And if you're willing to believe that Jesus is the Christ, He is the Messiah, you're willing to repent. We're not going to say, hey, well, repentance is not. No, repentance is necessary. It permeates throughout the Scriptures. That's what John the Baptist preached repentance. Jesus preached repentance. He gave repentance in the Great Commission. There on the day of Pentecost, they preached repentance. Uh, Simon, who fell into sin, he was told to repent. And Paul preached to the Gentiles that God commands all men everywhere to repent. It permeates. Yeah, that's kind of the tough command because that demands change. That demands killing the old man, killing the old self. And, and my desire is that the will of God might live in us. 
be willing to confess Jesus for men and be baptized for the remission of sins. You could be, you could, that's, that's how you get started. Started. That's not the end in view. That's, that's getting started. And then to rise to walk in newness of life. Grow and be faithful. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. That, that's possible. Good and perfect servant? No. Good and faithful servant. That's what the Lord said. And we can be that. We sometimes come short. Sometimes we fall, fall down. And so we ask God to forgive us and we get back up. And uh, seeking God to help us to be the kind of people we need to be. If we do err, we come back to repentance and prayer. Let's take a long part. We're going to sing the song of encouragement. If you need to give your life to Jesus and we can help you that in, you come and let us know while together as we stand and as we sing.